You are on uh, the platform, um, just having a chat with my guest in studio, second guest I've had in studio this week, and I love it because it's more intimate and it's easier to communicate face-to-face and eye-to-eye. You're less likely to be rude to each other too, uh, to be honest. But um, I just think it's wonderful we've got our guest, and he's been brought here by the Free Speech Union from the United States. He is a citizen of the world. He is an author, a journalist, a lawyer... Uh, an activist on many things, including, well, gay rights, gay marriage, mm. uh, freedom of speech. His name's Jonathan, let me get this right, Roush? Exactly right. Do Jonathan I, Roush. I must tell you, I am not a lawyer and do not play oh, you're not a on lawyer. TV. Yeah, those are fighting words. So oh, okay, sorry. Word. Sorry. Um, but a journalist, which is much better, uh, yes, in my exactly. humble opinion. And you've been brought here from by the Free Speech Union, Jonathan, to uh, give a couple of uh, speak, uh, speeches or, or, or evenings, discussions, and also talk to people like me in the media about freedom of speech. And university people. And, and university people. And talking to faculty, that yeah. sort of thing. And yes. specifically f- academic freedom of speech. Um, I was amazed a couple of weeks ago on this program... Um, when issues arose about uh, Jonathan Ayling from the Free Speech Union speaking at a, well, an event at Victoria University. And the student union uh, tried to cancel that event. Um, and I called for young people in universities to ring me on this program of a morning and... Um, what happened? Well, I was, firstly, I was amazed, our demographic is, is old in New Zealand, it's 45, 50 plus. Um, The lines were clogged from young people, you know, between the ages of 18 and 25. And what were they saying? And they were saying, we are very careful about what we say at our universities and institutions. We know that if we say the wrong thing, there are people who will come for us. And they're unhappy about that. Oh, they're incredibly unhappy about that. And I was just amazed at the reaction uh, we got, given our audience catchment and everything. and And then the emails went off. Then people have been writing to me ever since saying, I'm doing this course and I can't say what I think about this course or say this is wrong because I know I'll get marked down. Did they say they would have liked the event at uh, the university well, to go on? Yeah, and it is going to go on, but of course they've now well, stacked... They changed it, it right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's now stacked sort of thing, with hate yeah. speech advocates who have also got their right to freedom of speech, Jonathan, we've got to say. But it seemed to me it was it's a way different event than it was now, uh, than it was you know originally, and it's going to have a different vibe. And I guess even that change sends a message message to faculty and students at a university that oh you can't have too much free speech. Well, and of course, the irony of cancelling a free speech event yeah. is is very rich. Um, I've been here. This is the beginning of my fourth full day, and I have been amazed at how similar the stories are that I'm hearing here as I do in U.S. universities. I'm wondering what the transmission mechanism is, but the latest survey numbers of students Ooh, in the United media. States... Yeah, well, probably. Um, but among academics as well? In any case, among students in the United States, college students, university students, two-thirds say that they are afraid to give their honest opinions on political matters. That's higher than it's ever been. Only five years ago, it was more like just over 50%. And they say exactly what your students told you. It's not that they're so much afraid of speech codes and formal sanction. It's that they're afraid of getting just smashed on social media, canceled by their friends, and running into trouble with campus activists who lay down the law about what you can say. Yeah. Um, it has reached fever pitch, and I've got to say, my impression of what's happening on campuses in the United States is largely informed by TikTok, um, <laughs> Twitter, and Facebook. And were I to sit there only inside my echo chamber, I would say America is in revolt. Students, particularly at the Ivy League schools, are all waving Palestinian flags and wearing uh, the kaffa, the, um, the tea towel thing, around their head. Um, and there's a revolt going on. Is that the case, or is this a minority of people who are getting a disproportionate amount of coverage oh, of course and basically a... crowding the room with noise? Of course, it's, it's the latter. Yeah. Now, um, young people in America, I would guess the same is true here, are less sympathetic to Israel and specifically Zionism than older people. But the group that really wants to go out there with From the River to the Sea 
and that is making encampments and getting themselves arrested, that is, of course, as it always is, a, a much smaller group. But a lot of other people are afraid to cross that group, so you don't hear from them. Yeah. Sometimes freedom of speech can be challenging, right? Always. It can always be challenging. All right. I'm also really interested in what role the media has played in the way these discussions have, have are perceived and the lack of discussion we have now. It seems to me that news media almost across the world have failed to protect freedom of speech and they're the one group that, that should have traditional news media. Do you think they've played a role in this? And I'm going to call it a climate of fear that's been created, particularly as you say, for young people on campus. Well, that's interesting. I perceive the opposite. What is it about media behaviour that is alarming you? What are they suppressing? Um, we are, for example, uh, there is a meeting here on Saturday um, of people who are raising questions about the use of puberty blockers and surgical intervention to uh, treat young people with gender dysphoria, particularly minors. Uh, we have had um, the news media are reporting that convention as an anti-trans convention or gathering. We had a woman called Posey Parker who has got some international notoriety on women's rights issues coming here last year and the news media described her as a Nazi and an anti-trans activist and they, indeed they whipped New Zealand into such a frenzy that there was a violent when she went to a public park on her second day here and tried to have New Zealand women speak at an you know, open mic mm -hmm. event. Uh, there was violence, she was assaulted and police recommended she flee the country. Um, all gleefully reported by New Zealand news media, some of whom took part in the counter-protest. Um, so that's what I'm saying. That's the problem we've got yeah, here. I heard about that the moment I, I got off the plane. Yeah. In the US... I am a big fan of mainstream media, which I'm a product of, so, okay, so, yeah. I, so I would be. I think it did an extraordinary job, for example, of holding the Trump administration accountable and did the yeah. same for the Biden administration and the fiasco of Afghanistan. But there are particular cultural subjects on which it has been unreliable. Transgender has been one of them. Race has been another. What's been interesting to observe in my country, over the past two or three years, the tone has changed. You know, journalists, we tend to follow what is touted as expert opinion, whether it's on COVID <laughs> yeah. or on trans. Expert opinion is shifting on the trans issue. We've now got this very important CAS report, for example, yeah. out of the UK. It's beginning to sink in in the United States. The important questions have to be asked about the way trans youth are treated, and the media is beginning to follow that. So it's opening up. You're now hearing honest conversations about those issues that were not allowed for the most part, even three years ago. Uh, perhaps the same will happen here. Mm. Um, one would hope. And I think that on that issue, things are cha changing. Um, we've got other issues here. We've got, a, a, if you like, a race issue about uh, our constitutional arrangements as regards to I, a, I have, a treaty. Boy, I didn't... Sean, I barely got off the plane and started talking to people. The two things that come up again and again that I'm told are the sacred cows, which um, the good and the right-minded people shouldn't talk about in a candid way, are the Treaty of 1840 and its implications, number one, yeah. and transgender, number two. But we must and, talk about these things to, to have any enlightenment. 